you are in the right place. I'm going to give it a few minutes, see if anybody else joins our room here. And if they do, then we'll get started. Uh, I'm going to give it, I'd say a minute or two, and then we'll get started. And in the meantime, I'll talk because that's what I like to do. Uh, my name's Nick, and I know you've seen a couple of the videos, uh, either with your silverback or in general on the You Are A Home channel or website. Uh, I've been helping to test the um, silverback as well as some of the other components with the silverback. And I absolutely love this machine. So I wanted to take the opportunity with the Christmas season upon us. And you know, currently we're making all these Christmas gifts for our loved ones to sell at craft shows, to make some extra money. Uh, so I wanted to take a second to do a live video and walk through my process for creating something like a catch-all tray. Uh, and I was gonna show you two different ways to do that. I wanna show how to do it in Vetric V card, uh, because I know that even though it is an advanced software that costs a little bit more, it is a fantastic software and it's very powerful. So it's easy to develop in and I like to use it personally. And then I'll also show the easel side of it, which is very user friendly. There's free options. Uh, even the pro option is fairly inexpensive. Realistically though, uh, if you purchase the, um, the pro version of easel, you're going to end up spending more in the end than you would to buy a, um, a subscription, or not even a subscription, but to purchase the vCar software. The benefit of vCar software is you own it. Um, you can upgrade it to the next level if you like Pro or Aspire versus just desktop. You know, you're more than welcome to upgrade it depending on your needs. Um, obviously Aspire being almost $2,000, a little out of most people's budget, but eventually you can get there. So don't discount it. Um, if you've never seen the Silverback before, or if you've only seen it on the uh, on the website or on the Facebook page, this is a 60 by 60, uh, so roughly 24 inch by 24 inch, 60 centimeter by 60 centimeter uh, desktop CNC router. Now, the spindle that comes with this is a 400 watt spindle, and uh, it's a fantastic spindle. It's got plenty of power to do what most people want to do. In my case, I wanted to be able to run a little bit faster. I wanted to be able to run more aggressive bits. So I chose to upgrade to the Makita router as my spindle. So you'll see mine carving with the Makita spindle. Uh, I am using the Yora Home Dust Shoe on here. Uh, and I'm actually trying out a new, uh, a new brush set. So you'll see my lovely magenta brush set there. Uh, the versions that you get will not be pink, I promise. Uh, but for testing purposes, so you can keep track of it, they make them different colors, so we can tell what's what. Um, this is a really well-built machine. If you haven't used it before, if you haven't seen one, uh, it's fantastic. It's very similar to uh, the Genmitsu, uh, their Prover 4030, and then you have to upgrade to their 6060 uh, in design, but in functionality and the thought process that Yora has put into this machine is fantastic. Things like turning the C-channel around so that your lead screws are on the outside so they don't get clogged up with dust and debris while you're carving. Uh, the Z-axis assembly is completely different, in my opinion, a little bit stronger on this machine. Um, the ease of switching to a different spindle. So this one mount works for the spindle, the router, and the laser. You can just put in the different spacers to use the other two components with this. So it makes it really easy to switch between. You know, if I want to take this Makita router out, say I have an issue one day and I want to toss my original spindle back in, it's completely possible. Uh, also, being able to throw a laser in this and have a 24 by 24 area to, um, to laser engrave. Uh, I do have a smaller laser engraver and a CO2 laser to be able to cut with. So in this case, it'd be for doing something uh, this size. Actually, I have Something I'm working on, uh, so something this size, this is going to get a big circle cut out of it, it's going to end up being a Lazy Susan top, so it'll have a name carved into it, and then possibly like the established date for the family, as well as maybe like a laurel wreath. So I may do the laurel wreath and the established with the laser on this machine, because I can use the exact same zero position, all I have to do is install the laser on here. Uh, and then recarve the last name so it gives some definition. So lots of possibilities with this machine. Uh, but I know you didn't come here to, to listen to me babble about the machine. So I'm going to check the comments real quick. Make sure nobody's having too much of a hard time hearing me. I do talk loud. I am in my shop by myself. 
I have my wood stove going so I'm not talking over a heater. Um, so hopefully everybody can hear me well and see me well. I do have my, my studio lights set up. Um, I will bring you in nice and close for the computer. When it comes time to carve, I am going to put the camera on to carve. I will not be able to talk over the vacuum that I use for dust extraction. It's just too loud. I'll let it go on there, let you guys watch the carve, and I'll pull you back out and talk in between those steps of our carve. All right. Doesn't look like we have anybody saying they can't hear me, so apparently I talk loud enough. So we'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to develop a catch-all tray today, and I'm going to move you in close here to the computer. Sorry if you get a little uh, nauseous here. Bring you down in. Oop. All right. So first we'll start with uh, Vetric. I want to see... I want you to see how easy this software is to use and how powerful it is. A lot of people get scared off by a, a software like this, a more advanced software, and, and I don't want any of you to, to have that situation. Um, it is a really easy software to use, and it's going to give you a lot of uh, freedom when it comes to your design and how you intend to have it carved. Um, things like your tool paths are gonna be much more controllable in a program like this versus using the um, versus using something like easel. So the first page that we get to when we bring this up is our job setup. So in this case, we're doing a single sided carve uh, and then it wants us to set our size of our board. Um, so I'm going to set mine at one inch um, and then just to get the size of our or document appropriate here, our, our sample piece. Um, I'm going to quickly measure this piece of ambrosia that we're going to use for uh, our tray. So I've got, let's see here, uh, six and a half inches and way more length than I need. So we'll set this to 6.5 and we'll set our height. We'll leave it at 10. I don't think we're going to make anything that large. Um, and, and I guess we can make it 10 inches long. That's not a bad length to have. Our zero precision. Now you have a couple different options here. So you can set it from the material surface or the machine bed. Uh, if you set it from the machine bed, it, it does make it nice because you can set kind of an arbitrary zero point and then have your machine move out to alternate areas on your workpiece to do this carve. When I, I, I usually do material surface just because that's what we're all used to. We're used to zeroing off of, say, the lower right corner or the lower left corner and getting that to be our start point and working from there. Once you get a little bit more advanced, you can start working with something like working from the machine bed surface, which makes bit changes a lot easier. Uh, datum position, I want my XY position to be where this little red mark is down here in the corner. It's the lower left. You could set it to be the center. You could set it to be anywhere around the document that you like. Um, and then we're going to hit OK. So that gives us our size. That gives us our location for where we're going to start at. You can see here I have 10 inches of length and I have six and a half inches of width to work with. So I'm going to first start out with a rectangle. Now, instead of clicking and dragging, you can actually do everything over here in this point where it says draw a rectangle. So the first thing that we're going to do is I want radius corners because I want to have a nice rounded shape and feel to, uh, the, to the tray itself. So I'm going to do rounded corners. You could do something like three eighths of an inch, a quarter inch, half inch, whatever you like as far as a a radius here. I'm going to leave mine at a quarter inch and then for size I'm going to set mine at six inches wide and our height we're going to do 10 inches and then when I hit create oh so actually then if we 
So it's telling us here, this is where it's going to be anchored to. So right now it's selected as the center. And it says the center is going to be at 3.824 inches and 3.1047 inches. So what we can actually do is we can select the lower left corner and say we want that to be at 0, 0. Now when I hit create, it creates it with this lower left corner being our origin point. This makes it really easy to set your position there. Uh, now, now that I've created the outer perimeter of our tray, so now we know we're going to have a 6 inch wide tray by 10 inches long. Now I can set the little internal trays. So I want to divide this up into, you know, I'm actually going to change this up. Uh, before uh, and in the picture that you might have seen earlier today on the Facebook page, I set this, or I did a, a three compartment, one large compartment and two smaller compartments. Um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to start with um, two large compartments and see how that looks on here, and then we'll add a third if we like it. So now's the point where I can just draw on here if I wanted to, or I can set the sizes and then just click create, and it's going to create a new uh, piece. So the thing is I want a half inch on each side to give me a decent chunk of material on the outside edges. So I'm going to make this five inches wide and then for my height I'm going to do arbitrarily four inches and click create. Now that I've created this rectangle when I click close here I'm able to select that vector and move it around. Now you can also use, <coughs> I apologize, uh, you can also use the align objects. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to align this to the top of this object. So I select the object I want to move first, then the object I'm moving it within. I'm going to move it to the top and then I'm going to center it left and right. And all these options are down here. So the, the left and right is down here. The top is up here on this top line. It's a pretty easy movement. Uh, the nice part is now it makes it uh, perfectly centered. So all I have to do is select this one, uh, this one rectangle, and then I can start moving it down until the spacing appears the way that I like it. <clears throat> so in this case, a half inch. Now you can also take off your 10 inch mark, um, you can bring down a ruler. Um, and I don't mess with this a whole lot, but it can be handy if you wanted to run a ruler down off of these, um, off of these marks. So you can experiment with that, see how you like it. It is nice to put some grid lines out there and be able to align stuff nicely. Uh, I don't run into many issues with um, with alignment and being able to set the stuff up. <clears throat> now I'm going to, yeah, I'm actually going to do three here also. So I'm going to, I'm going to do two down here at the bottom, uh, more horizontal or more vertical instead of horizontal. So I'm going to select the rectangle tool. I'm going to create a rectangle, uh, that is, we'll do four inches again. And instead of five inches wide, we're going to do uh, two inches wide. And now we have that created. So I'm going to move it over. Now, one thing that you can do when you go to move this is you can select a line and you'll see that it pops up right here where it's showing us that we're aligned with that particular space. And then we can move up to get our half inch spacing. And it looks like we actually have a decent amount of space between these two trays. So I can actually stretch this up. And there we go. So now we have, oh, and we'll stretch this down a little bit. All right, move that down. 
All right, so that looks good. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to control C and control V to copy and paste. And then I'm gonna move my new rectangle over. And again, I'm just gonna grab it and let it line up with that edge. Uh, now you can see we have a decent amount of space in the middle here, so we're going to stretch these over and get ourselves a little bit closer to the center. Uh, so we're 2.267 and we're 2.250. So we're going to make this one just a tiny bit bigger. Um, if you want to edit any of these things, so like this one, when I click here down in this bottom corner, I can see that my uh, rectangle's width is 2.2667. So what I can do is I can click on this one and I can click the rectangle to tool and I can type 2.2667 and hit enter. And now it's going to produce me a rectangle that's that size that I needed. So now I can drag it in, drop it where it needs to be, select the old one, delete it out, and then the last thing I got to do is stretch this out. Now if you start stretching and you go to an adjacent line, it'll actually match up to that line, make it a lot easier. There we go. So we have the basics of a tray. Um, you see we had set our material to six and a half inches wide. We're actually going to only going to use six inches of it. So we have our, our six inch rectangle. We have our large tray and our two smaller tray cutouts. Now from here, what I want to do is I want to set a tool path to create a um, to create a tool path for my bowl bit. So I'm going to select using shift all three of the recesses. I'm going to click on Toolpath up here in the top left. Click on Show Toolpath tab. And it's going to bring in my toolpath operations. So this is going to be a pocketing toolpath. So I'm going to select Pocket Toolpath over here on the right hand side. And then I'm going to click under Tools. I'm going to click Select. Now I use uh, Amana, Whiteside, um, some of the name brand um, end mills and such. So I've actually already pulled in my Amana master tool. So I know that this three quarter inch diameter quarter inch shank bowl bit is the bowl bit that I'm going to be using to um, carve this out. Now, the cool part is if you use Amana, Whiteside, bits and bits, um, CMT, any of those big manufacturers bits, you can actually import their uh, their tool catalog or their tool library into Vetrix so that you can use that to um, to pull your tool right in without having to guess. So it sets things like chip load and step overs that are appropriate for that tool. So I'm going to select this. Now we're going to set our depth here. So up here we have start depth, we want to start at zero. Our cut depth, we're going to cut to 0.5 inches. So that's right here. Once I set that, uh, I'm going to go into edit for my tool. I'm going to make sure that my feed rate is appropriate, my plunge rate is appropriate. And I know just from using this tool that I can step it up a decent amount um, with the 29% step over that's recommended with it. Um, you can set climber conventional. You can set how many passes you want this cut to occur in. Um, in this case, I'm going to edit the passes, and it, it was currently doing um, 0.125 inches each cut. So I'm actually going to increase, and I'm going to say do six passes so that I'm cutting a little bit less than a tenth of an inch on each pass. Now you can set in this also a plunge uh, move so either a straight plunge or you can have it ramp in at either a particular distance or um, a particular angle with this type of bit it only gives you a distance so like point zero, or zero point three is going to ramp in 
over that 0.3 inches at whatever the angle is between zero and that. Um, it is a good idea to ramp in if you're using something that doesn't have a bottom cutting portion. In this case, my Amana bowl bit does have a, a bottom clearing portion. So because it can do bottom clearing, um, technically I can just plunge right in. I still like to use a ramp. It makes it easier on the, um, it makes it a lot easier on the bit and on the machine. <clears throat> Once that's done, we're going to hit create, or I'm sorry, calculate, and then it's going to think through that. Um, and I'm actually going to, oh, what I do here? I got to remove a tool path. I had an extra tool path in here somehow. Oh, that's what happened. Okay, so if you have another tool in there, you just have to remove that other tool out of there. Now I can do calculate. And it gives me all one tool path. Now, the cool part about VCarve is now I can do preview. And it's going to show me my cut. So there we are. We have our recesses set. So we can zoom in, we can see what it looks like, and this is pretty dang true to real life, uh, with the exception of windrows or whatever you want to call them, where you can see the direction that the grain was laid over or the fibers were laid over as the bit was passing it. Um, so you'll end up with some kinds of, um, of lines that'll be visible that I've had to be lightly sanded. Uh, what I'm going to show you next, basically we're going to do the exact same tool path. So we're going to leave these selected and we're going to set another pocketing tool path. Now in this one, we're going to go under cutting depth and we're going to change our start depth to 0.5 and our cut depth to 0 0.02. So that's going to cut two one hundredths of an inch and we're going to start at the half an inch mark. So what this is going to do is go from our last stopping point down to our uh, finish point. And, and truly it's arbitrary. It doesn't matter if you're going to have, um, if you're going to use half an inch or 0.52. It's not going to matter. Nobody's going to take out calipers and measure your bowl to see if you went a half inch. There's no hard and fast rule to it. Uh, because we are cutting so little, I'm going to remove the ramping plunges on this one. And I'm also going to go in and edit my bit. And I'm going to, down here under feed rate, I'm going to speed that up to 100 inches per minute. And I'm going to change my step over under cutting parameters. I'm going to change my step over to 10%. That way I can create as few of those lines as possible and get a nice clean bottom. Click calculate. Now when I, I run these tool paths, you'll see it comes in with that second tool path and it just clears out a little bit more of the tool or of the uh, of the pocket there. And actually it looks like that might have created a, a, a bad situation here. So we'll look at that. Um, so let's go ahead and we're going to reset our preview and we're going to um, preview all of our tool paths again and see because what it did it threw an extra tool path out here um, that was come on okay we're good just want to make sure we weren't going to have any issues when we go to cut this all right last thing we need to do we go back to our 2d preview we're going to select our outer perimeter and we're going to select on tool paths a profile tool path now, what I'm going to do, the thickness of my material, uh, just under an inch, so I don't need to cut down a full 1.1 inches that I do a lot of times on my one inch stock. So this is only 0.88 inches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 0.9 inches. Uh, I'm using a quarter inch end mill. I'm going to edit my passes to reduce that. Now I'm using a compression bit for my cutout. So I actually want to go a little bit deeper than what some people would. So I want to go at least 
0.15, if not 0.2 um, inches per pass. And that allows me to get down below my compression point where the two uh, profiles meet. I'll click OK there. I'm going to edit my end mill. I'm going to make sure that my feed rate is reasonably slow. I don't want to blow through the material with that deep of a cut. Click OK. Uh, and then we'll click Calculate. Preview all of our tool paths here. Everything looks good. Cuts out. Now, you'll see on here it shows that it didn't cut all the way through. What we can do is we can go to our material setting, which is up here in the top left, and we can change this to 0.88. And now it'll show that we cut through with that particular tool path. So now it'll show our cut. We're gonna cut our, um, our first tool path with the bolt clearing with our bowl bit. Come on. Preview all. It's moving at a snail's pace. All right, I'm gonna end that. Not worth sitting there watching that. All right, anyhow, so V-Carve Desktop, that's essentially how we're going to create our tray. Now I'm gonna go in, we're actually gonna create and then carve this tray in easel so um, anybody can do it. Let's go ahead into, oh, I have easel open right here. So we'll open a new project in easel. The internet's extremely slow since I'm streaming and trying to do this. I hope the video quality is as good as it looks on the computer and on the phone here. All right, so we have our easel project. We're going to go in first. Up here, we're going to select our material. So I'm going to select... Um, I'll do hard maple. It, really, the only reason why you're selecting the material type is so that the predetermined cut settings are in there um, if they're saved, but we're going to edit some of those settings anyhow. Um, we're going to set our width to six and a half inches, six and a half inches, our length to 10 inches, our thickness to 0.88, and now we're good. So now we have over on this side, a six and a half inch by 10 inch workpiece. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to do so that I can see um, see what's happening over here in close to real time or close to realistic is I'm going to leave this set on an eighth inch. If you're not set on an eighth inch bit, go ahead and select it. It just lets you see kind of what's going on. Um, once we're done creating our our initial design here, we'll actually pull it out and duplicate it, and then we'll change our bit settings for each one of the duplications. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna select shapes, a square, and I'm gonna make this square the size of our workpiece. So here's the easiest way to do it. We're gonna use the lower left corner. We're going to set our position at zero. Come on and zero and then our size we're going to make 6.5 by 10 inches come on and that makes it so it covers our entire work piece here now we don't want this to actually cut a pocket. We want instead, so right now selected on clear out of pocket, we're going to select instead uh, cut outside the shape path. 
and that's because we want to preserve as much of our material as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut around the outside of the the shape so that whatever our true size is. So like right now we set this at um, we set this at six and a half by ten inches. So we'll get a true six and a half by ten inch piece. If we used a quarter inch bit to cut this out and we set it at six and a half by ten, then we're going to lose that eighth inch on each side. So we overall lose a quarter inch in each direction. Now, uh, our cut depth for this particular piece, we want to cut all the way through. Um, you can do add depth here, and what that allows for, it's right underneath your depth. It's a pro setting, and it's basically if you had set your, um, your workpiece depth to the exact size of it, and then you want to cut an additional, say, tenth of an inch to make sure that you clear all the way through the material, you can add that additional depth here. Um, it, it is a good tool to use if you're not sure or if you didn't measure 100% accurately. So I'm actually going to set it. I'll, I'll leave it at this uh, 0 0.05. So it's going to add 0 0.05 to the depth of our workpiece. And from there, we are good to go with this square. Oh, actually, I want to, down here, I want to remove tabs. So I'm going to uncheck Use Tabs. Um, and that's it for that one. Now we're going to create an additional square in here. And we're going to set it at, um, let's see here, we'll do three inches wide by four inches tall. We'll move this into place over here, and then we'll control C, control V to create a duplicate. Now the size on this is actually a little too big, so we're going to delete that one. We'll go back to this one and change our sizing here. So we're going to change our side, our size to two and a half inches. That looks a little bit better. Um, and then what we can do is we can set our um, our X position to say a half an inch. So we'll change that to 0.5. And that brings us a half inch from this edge. And then we'll do 0.5 for our Y position. And that brings us in 0.5 or a half an inch from the bottom. So now we have from the left, from the bottom, we have an equal spacing. We're going to control paste. Come on. Oop. Back that up. Control C, control V. There we go. Now we've got one pasted in there. And what we'll do, so we know we were a half inch here. And then we know that this is two and a half inches, right? So we'll add that half inch and our two and a half inches. So for our X, we'll make this three inches. Um, and then we'll actually add a half inch in between there. So 3.5 inches. And we'll leave Y at 0.5 inches. So we still want it to be a half inch off the bottom. Now, those are just arbitrary measurements. Uh, they roughly get us a nice little... Uh, a look here so that we're evenly spaced on all the sides. So we have half inch, half inch, half inch, half inch from the bottom. Now we'll make our third and final rectangle. Again, we're going to take our X measurement, we're going to bring it in 0.5 inches, and then I'm going to actually stretch this down. and then out to get our rough size here. Diesel does not like to work on this computer in my shop, but that is okay. Um, so we're going to go to uh, 4.5 inches on the height, and we'll go to 
five and a quarter on the width, five and a half on the width. Let's see, we have six and a half. We need a half inch on each side, so we have five, so we need five and a half here. 5.5, .5. and then we have a decent spacing there. So now we want to bring this down a half inch from the top corner. So what I can do here is I can say 9.5 for that top corner where it should land. And now I know that I'm a half inch from the end. I already know that I'm a half inch from this side. Um, so we are good to go there. So now we have our three compartments. Um, I'm gonna select all three of these components. I'm going to set my cut depth to a half an inch. We're gonna leave it on clear out pocket. So now we have the basics of our design. So to actually set our tool paths and create our own way of viewing this, uh, this project so we can actually cut it appropriately, since we can only use either a roughing and then a finish tool or just the one tool, I'm gonna duplicate this particular piece. So I'm gonna duplicate it and then duplicate it again. And that gives us, this first one is gonna be our roughing for our pockets. The second one is gonna be our finish pass for our pockets. And then this third one here is going to be our final cutout of our shape. Now, the issue that we run into with easel, um, we can't just click and add a fillet. Um, we can't round the corners of this easily. Honestly, when it comes to easel, um, just cutting this out and then taking it over to the sander and knocking the edges off is pretty much the best way that I've found. It's just easier. You can do it um, using the apps or using a circle and then combining it. It's not worth that much time when a sander takes two minutes to knock down all four corners nice and smooth. All right, so on this first workpiece, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete our surrounding cut, our, our cut through. So we're gonna delete that. Now we're only working with our pockets. I'm gonna select all three of my pockets. I'm gonna make sure that they're cut cutting at 0.5 inches that they're set on clear out of pocket. I'm gonna go over to my bit. And in this case, I actually, um, I'm not sure if it's in here or not. I need to create a bit. Okay, so I have my bowl bit in here. So you can either create a bit if you have pro, if you don't, um, you can try to find a bit that they have included. But basically, I just created a bit that's three quarters of an inch around. Now, it doesn't know that it's a bowl bit. So it doesn't know that the bottom edges are rounded. All it knows is that it's three quarters of an inch around. So, again, not a very intelligent system. Um, it doesn't know that it's the ball nose type, so it has rounded or has radius edges. Um, so it's not going to give you a perfect preview, but it does work. So that's going to show our three quarters of an inch. Um, from here, we can simulate that cut. Um, you can see here it says it's going to take us an hour and 20 minutes to cut that. Holy crap. Uh, we're never going to take an hour and 20 minutes to cut that. That would be silly. You can see here they had it set on a very conservative 28 inches a minute with only um, 0 0.028 inches per pass. We're going to change this to... 100 inches 100 goodness not 1000 100 inches per minute a plunge rate of 40 inches a minute and for this particular bit now keep in mind this is for my bit with the makita router our depth per pass we're going to go 0.1 inches per pass and we are going to ramp in at five percent or five degrees not five percent Five degrees. Now, when we click simulate, let's see what it says now. Eight minutes, much better. All right, so now that we have that, we're going to go to our next work piece. Again, we're going to delete this perimeter cut. Delete that there. We're gonna select our pockets. And we're going to change our pocket depth to 0.5 two inches. 
Now this is going to take that last little bit and, and make it nice and smooth uh, since we're taking such a small amount of material in this pass. I'm also going to go to my cut settings. I'm going to change it to manual. We're going to use the same settings, 100 inches a minute, 40 inches a minute plunge. And then the difference here is for our depth per pass, to be able to go right down to our depth at the bottom and then cut our point two, we're going to go say 0.6. Anything more than 0.5 inches um, so that it cuts it all in one pass. We don't need to ramp on this one with this particular bit, so I'm going to leave ramping off on this particular one. So you can see here, uh, it says it's going to take 10 minutes to cut this. Um, and actually, oh, here's why. 40 inches a minute. Let's see if that changes anything here. Simulate. Uh, it still says 10 minutes. Now, what's going to happen when we go to cut this particular... Oh, I'm sorry, that's why. It's set on an eighth inch bit here, so we actually have to change that. I did not catch that initially. And I'm sorry if I sound sniffly. I have not been feeling great here. Uh, so three quarters of an inch bowl bit. Cut settings, 140.6. All right, we're still good. Now when we click simulate, all right, two minutes. That's much better. Now when we go to cut this pass, you see these really wide cuts that it's going to make. So it's trying to do a standard 40% step over, which is fine for a roughing pass. When we actually go to do this cut, we're actually going to go into machine and then general settings, and we're going to change our step over right here. Instead of 40%, for this particular cut, we're going to cut it at a 10% step over, uh, which is going to make it significantly more clean on the bottom there. Um, you don't want to go in and change those numbers unless you really know what they mean. In this case, I'm telling you, if you go to do this for your finished pass that you created separately, doing that is a good idea. If you did it on a roughing pass that you were going to take a tenth of an inch at a time over a, a period of time, you're going to end up taking forever to carve it, is all that's going to happen. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, in some cases, you may end up with a bit that's not dispersing enough of the heat just because you're not taking enough material per revolution. Um, but when we're doing something in the bottom of, of a dish like this where we're taking a really small, fine cut, not an issue. So, now we have our two... Uh, tray portion set. So we have our roughing pass, we have our finish pass. Now we're going to do for our third uh, work piece down here, we're going to do our outline, our actual cutout. So we're going to delete out our pockets and now we're going to make sure that we're set to go all the way through our material and we're going to select our bit. So in this case, I want it to be a uh, a quarter inch. Um, you can set it to up cut, down cut, whatever you want. Um, it depends on the bit that you're using. In my case, I'm using a compression bit to cut out items like this. So I'm going to use an aggressive cut um, and I'm just going to select a down cut on this. Um, really the only reason why you're selecting this bit here is for diameter and then preset cut settings. So I'm going to select this down cut bit and then I'm going to come over to my cut settings and I'm going to set these per my bit. Yours will be different. I promise uh, it's not going to be the same. They never are. So, you know, if you need help, you can always feel free to uh, tag me in a comment or in a question if you need some help selecting a feed rate or something. Um, I don't mind helping out with that. Do keep in mind, though, when it comes to uh, like Messenger and stuff, this is my personal account, so I, I'd prefer not messages, but if you do tag me in something, I will pop in and try and help where I can. All right, so this plunge rate here, because I'm going, um, I'm going to be plunging pretty deep, I'm going to set it at 10 inches a minute, and then my depth per pass, this is where my compression bit is going to vary a lot from other bits that you might use. I'm actually going to go 0.2 inches each pass. Now, if you try to do that with a down cut bit with no adaptive clearing of any sort and no 
uh, no vacuum to pull away debris, you're going to have a bad day. Um, in this case, I, I use this setting pretty regularly, so I am confident with my setting. I also do a five degree ramp, which is a pretty long ramp in, which lets me be able to clear out. And, and it kind of does negate the uh, initial little bit. Uh, the benefit of that up and down cut compression, but it allows me to get down to that depth. Um, I could also do a 20 degree, which I'll go ahead and do here. Again, it'll help to clear out some of that, that chip load before it gets all the way down, and then I'll just have a small piece that'll need sanded as we go through it. All right, so now I'm set there, and now we're pretty much ready to carve. So. Uh, it's not going to look like anything in easel because I have three different work pieces to achieve one work piece's worth of of, um, of design here. So you're not going to see a completed piece on this one page, uh, unfortunately, unlike in V-Carve. Uh, and if you're just joining, I know I saw a couple people pop up I haven't seen. Uh, we did design this in V-Carve first. So once this video is over, you'll be able to go back and view it. You can watch the V-Carve setup. Um, here in V-Carve, though, I can take and I can preview all my tool paths together. And I can view them in a 3D format. Come on, computer. So I can look at my, my final product here. And I can move it around to actually look at it. You, you just can't do this in easel. Uh, I said earlier, easel's great for quick and easy design, down and dirty design work. V-Carve is going to give you a lot more control over production pieces. Um, this is basically the design that I'm using for trays. And I know that I can design it in here and I could run this a thousand times and not have an issue once I get these tool paths set the way I want them. But more people use easel. So we're going to carve it using easel today. So I'm going to pop you guys back out a little bit. Uh, I'm going to get my workpiece situated, and then we'll go ahead and carve. And like I said, for the carve, I'm just going to let the camera go. It is too loud to try and talk over, so I'll let it cut. We only have, uh, let's see, we had eight minutes on that one, two minutes on our second cut, and our third cut. Let me go ahead and simulate here. It's five minutes. So we have right around 15 minutes of carving um, feel free to stick around and watch it if you like to watch the cnc go around if you don't then you can pop out pop back in as you please i'm gonna step you back here real quick sorry if i'm making anybody sick all right so I'm going to be using a piece of ambrosia maple uh, that I picked up the other day to make this dish out of. And I'm going to use tape and CA glue. And that allows me a workpiece to be able to be secured and not have to use tabs. I don't like unnecessary sanding. If you like to use tabs to hold stuff in place, then you could obviously clamp this down. I like to be able to use as much of the workpiece as possible. And I like to be able to... Um, to not have to use those tabs. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get the machine out of my way. So I'm gonna send it backwards, uh, say 10 inches. So what you can actually do, you can go to your jog controls in the machine control. You could set it to 10 inches for a custom X, Y, and then you can send it to the back and instead of hitting one inch each time and sending it back little bits at a time, it's nice, it just clears it out of the way for you there. Now, I say the CA, CA glue and blue tape. Uh, I do have blue tape. What I found is with this compression bit that I use, it is a little bit more aggressive. So I've been using the green frog tape and it seems to be, uh, to hold its tack a little bit better and to hold down better when I make aggressive cuts with my compression bits. You don't have to use it, you can use the blue tape. It's, it still works. This I just have found works a little bit better for me. So the easiest way to do this is, I know that I'm going to use this little auxiliary fence that I placed on my machine. So I know my first piece of tape is going to go right along that, or right along that fence. 
My second piece of tape, I want to go on this piece of my raised bed that I have here. Now, I can take my work piece and I can see if there's any additional room for another piece of tape. In this case, this one piece of tape is going to hold down my tray. This piece here should hold down the outside, but I'm going to take another piece and I'm going to run it and straddle this right here. This side of my piece, since I'm going to flip it in like this, I want this piece, this ambrosia staining, I want it to be a part of my dish on the top. Uh, it'll cut down into the bowl, which will be really nice. So I'm going to take it and I'm going to flip it over like this and then flip it around. Now what that allows me to do is line up my tape really easily because now I just put a line where there's a line of tape on the machine. And then when I flip it back over, it'll all be aligned and I don't have to worry about it uh, CA gluing itself to the bed of that machine, which I've done, and it's not always easy to remove. Take one, take two. You can use whatever CA glue you like. I like the medium thickness of this 2P10. It tends to be uh, the right viscosity where it's not running off, uh, but it comes out of the bottle smooth enough to be able to get nice clean lines of glue. So I'm going to add my glue and then I'm going to spray my activator onto my tape. So some people will leave this lay here and then spray their activator and you end up accidentally activating some of your glue ahead of time and you can end up with some wonky work pieces. I always hold it away, spray my activator, and then I'm going to take my work piece and place it in. Now, I have this convenient auxiliary fence, so I'm able to kind of rock this into place and line it up easily. So I just rock that one corner in and place it. And I know that the front of this auxiliary fence that my bit can reach there so it allows me to not go out to the end and then run into a limit stop or something uh, so I highly suggest adding something like this and the nice part is I added this so I just put a piece of plywood down here screwed it down and I left it long this way uh, in the x-axis and then I took my uh, I took my machine and I trimmed it to be absolutely straight with the y-axis. That way that I'm sure that it's in line there. Uh, it makes it really easy for positioning things, especially with tiling, uh, to use something like that. And I just leave it on there all the time, and if I need to take it off, then I just pull out some screws and, and take it off. All right, now we're gonna set our zero. We're gonna bring our machine back forward. So I already have it set to 10 inches of movement. So I'm gonna bring it back forward 10 inches. You can see it's pushing my can off there. That'd be really fun to have explode next to a, uh, a wood burner, right? And now we're going to check our, our zeros. So the easiest way to do this, since we're going to cut our bowl first, we're going to set uh, our machine in position front to back, left to right, on this corner here. I'm going to go ahead and set it using this quarter inch bit uh, just to get a rough area. So I'm going to move it in and I'm going to find where I want it to be and I'm going to raise it up and I'm going to switch out my bowl bit which is a lot harder to see the exact center uh, of this bit because it's a big rounded bowl bit. Uh, so this will allow you to get a lot more accurate of a, a zero point. Pull it out, we'll switch it out for our bowl bit and then we'll set our Z height and then we'll go through the whole easel, uh, you know, click to carve stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and move this up to get it over the top of our left corner there. And I'll move you guys in to see a little bit closer here. Again, I'm sorry if I'm making anybody sick. It can be difficult to move this tripod around without shaking everywhere. All right, so I'm going to bring this in over this corner here. 
So we're going to walk her in one inch. We'll change down to a tenth of an inch. And we're going to bring our bit down. So it looks like we are pretty well aligned in both directions there. So that's where I want my X and Y zeros to land, is right in this corner here. So now what I'm going to do is I want to raise up the bit as high as I can go. And then I'm going to change out for my bowl bit that I literally set down somewhere. There it is. All right. So here's a trick. Because I have this added height here, I don't always have enough room to be able to pull this bit out. So what i found is if I take the collet all the way out, I can drop it down underneath this workpiece without having to uh, without having to undo any of my settings. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take the collet all the way out. Now I'm gonna switch out my compression bit with my bowl bit. And you see this has a nice long shank and this is specifically designed so you can get really deep with this bit. Um, obviously we're not going very deep here, but you can get, um, I'd say probably almost an inch and a half to two inches of depth out of this bit uh, before you start losing, um, before you start losing the shank and it starts to become a little bit too wobbly to work with. All right, so we'll get this tightened in here. Now again, I'm running the Silverback 6060 with the Makita upgrade. Um, the upgrade's easy, you just buy the router and put it in there. Now I have done some modification to this so that when I turn on my spindle, it kicks on a uh, relay in the back over here, which then activates my spindle and my vacuum. It makes life easy, uh, but it's not 100% necessary. Um, I will try to do a write-up on how that's done for anybody who'd like to know, and uh, I'll post it in this page. All right, now, uh, now that we know we're in our X, Y, zero, the, where we want it at, now we're going to come down with our bowl bit, and we're going to set our Z height. So we're going to move down, start at tenths of an inch, and we're really close there. Now we're going to step down to hundredths, and there we go. We're right on the surface there. Now, I've used the Z probe. Uh, it's pretty easy to use for beginners. The issue with the Z probe for me is I have to take it from here and come out here to set my Z height um, off of this surface here. The issue that I've found is that when I do that and I want this bit to be in here and I want to set this zero using that other bit like we just did, I can't do the Z probe. So I've just gotten accustomed to setting this height by eye um, or using the paper method which is just taking a thin piece of paper and sliding it underneath there until you feel some resistance um, to get yourself that thousandths of an inch roughly space between the bit and the, the work piece. Uh, but I, I'm happy with just using my eye. I can see underneath there. We're all set. So I'm going to click carve on the machine. and I'll, I'll bring you over here to the computer. So I'm going to click carve here on this first workpiece, which is a roughing pass for our um, for our bowl bit. Click carve. We're going to confirm our material thickness. Our material is secure, and we are using our three quarters of an inch bowl bit. Now, I'm going to use manual to set my work zero, and I'm going to say use new position. And that sets that new position that I just created to being the um, active zero. And I'm going to click raise the bit. Now what you'll notice is the bit itself uh, raised, but it did not raise enough to get my dust collection cover under there. So I'm going to 
bring this up as far as it'll go without hitting the limit. Now, this won't affect your zero height in any way, but it allows you to be able to get this um, dust cover underneath here. And then when you're using this Yora Home uh, dust collection, the important thing to look at, um, let me see if I can get you down here far enough, is that you want the bit to be just above the bristles there because you want the bristles to make contact with the wood and then your bit to make contact. Um, if not, you'll not really have much in the way of dust collection. So that's why there's this extension piece here. It's a, a separate piece and you can actually, I think coming up soon, you'll be able to order these pieces additional. So if you do have like an extra long bit, you can use that to set your distance there. Um, it at minimum comes with one also, I said it earlier in the video, your dust shoe will not have this pink ring here. Um, this is just a prototype to test some of these bristle, bristle thicknesses. So don't worry, you're not going to get a pink um, pink dust shoe here. It's just to keep track of the stiffness and lengths of the bristles in the fill there. Um, but enough of me talking. We're going to go ahead and carve. I'm going to let this run. It's going to be loud. Um, I'm going to run this one and then I'll set my second carve. I'll talk for a second and then I'll set that to carve. Um, and then we'll come back again, do our third carve and change out the bit for our compression bit. And, uh, and then once we're done, we'll talk a little bit and we'll look at our final product. I'll show you how I sand it and finish it. Um, and then we'll be good to go. We'll, we'll take her to market. Um, it's a great little project to take out with you to shows or to give to family for the holidays. So I, I hope you guys have enjoyed this so far. And uh, yeah, give me a like or a, a love button in the chat there if you're hanging out with me. I definitely appreciate it. And let's go.
All right, so we finished cutting, and I'm actually going to show you real quick before moving over to the computer. So this is the roughing pass, and this is a 40% step over. And you see the ridges that it leaves. It's just, it's a big bit, and it doesn't have a very good step over. So with this, um, leaving all of these little ribs in here, that'd be a lot of sanding to get rid of that. These are, you can feel them. Um, they're definitely deep. So what we do is we're going to run a finishing pass. Let me swing you around here. So in easel, uh, let me bring it back here to the computer. We're going to go to our second workpiece. Now this is our one that's only going to cut a or two um, hundredths of an inch in one pass. And this is where we're going to take this machine tab, general settings, and we're going to change our step over to 10%. All right. Now, when we click simulate, it's going to take significantly longer to cut what we'd said was two minutes previously. Um, when I click simulate now, you see it's going to take five minutes because we went to machine and we changed under general settings our step over to 10%. Now, the important thing is if you had set this... Um, this pocket here to cut 0.2 inches and then you zeroed it in the bottom of this instead of setting this to cut 0.52 inches um, what would have happened is every time it went in one of these red lines here in our tool path it would have just cut right through your workpiece so that's why in easel it's not as intuitive so you have to make sure that our depths that we set it to 0.52 and we use our same zero point we used before so I'm going to click Carve, we're going to confirm the material thickness again, material secured, and we're still using our uh, bowl bit. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click Manual for our zero position, and we're going to click Use Last Position. It's easy, it's foolproof, you're not going to end up with your zero changing and then end up with a pocket that's a different size. Use Last Position, and then you just walk through your um, your cut start settings. So I'm going to put you back on the workpiece. Uh, again, we have five minutes, so pop in and out as you want. Here in five minutes, I'll be back on uh, to talk about changing out for the compression bit and getting that set up.
All right. So there we're done with our finishing pass and try and get you in close. That is smooth. Um, very little sanding, if any at all. So I think we're going to be good there. Now I'm going to change out my bit. Um, if you weren't here for the beginning part of the video, I am using a compression bit. So my cut is going to be slightly more aggressive than some people's. If you don't know what a compression bit is, basically this bottom flute here is an up cut and the top flutes here are down cuts. And what that allows you to do is move through your material and pull fibers on the bottom up and fibers from the top down to give you a nice clean cut on both top and bottom of the material. Um, not necessary to use it, just my preferred bit. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to leave the machine in the same zero position for X and Y, and I'm going to raise the machine and change out this bit. Now I have to take the collet all the way out to change the bit, simply because the uh, the bowl bit is too long to get it out when it's over top of a piece of material. So here we'll pop this out. Take off the collet. And that allows me to drop the whole thing out. I'm going to put it back in my tray here. And we'll install our compression bit. So now I have my compression bit inserted into the machine. I'm going to bring down my Z-axis and get this placed right on the surface of the material. And there we go. Now that I have that done, I'm going to go in to easel. And I'm going to select my cutout tool path. And this is what's actually going to cut the outer perimeter of my shape here. So I'm going to um, click carve, verify my material and my bit. I'm going to select manual for my zero. And then I'm going to click new position. Since I have that bit positioned right at the top of the material in the XY zero that I had predetermined, I'm going to click use new position. And then I'm going to click raise bit. Now it's going to pull the bit off um, and I'll show you. It's not, it's never quite enough to be able to get the, um, oops, sorry, shaky. It's never quite enough to get the dust collector under. I mean, there's no way I'm going to get this dust boot underneath there. So then once you set your zero, you can move your Z axis up without affecting your zero position. And now I can slide that underneath and get it set in position. And I heart y'all, but um, I, I'm not gonna cut without the dust collection. It's just too messy in here um, and it flings chips everywhere. So unfortunately, we're stuck dealing with the, uh, the dust collection, but you'll be able to see how well this compression bit cuts once we get this first cut done. Um, this cut should take us about five minutes. Again, leave it on if you'd like. Pop back in here in five minutes, it's up to you. Uh, but I'm going to let this cut and then we'll go into some finishing.
So there we go, we've got this cut out, and I'm gonna send my machine home just to get it out of my way. So we'll, we'll run a homing sequence, let it clear out of here, and then we'll pop our piece off. And you, you saw I got this set a little bit close to my uh, fence here, so I now have a new line for where my fence is going to go, which is all good. Um, I replace this every, every so often. Anyhow, I think I've had four or five different ones on here just in the last couple of months. Um, so no worries there. Feed the, uh, feed the old wood burner there for a second. And pop this off. And you see the tape comes right off, no issues. Um, peel these free. Again, feed the, feed the wood burner here. Keeping me warm. I don't know where some of you guys are from, but here in Ohio, it is a chilly day. It's been snowing all day for the day after Thanksgiving. Um, all right, so we can see our cut. Let me get you over into some light. It's a little bit better here. All right, so you can see the bottom of this came out really smooth. We do have a little bit of, uh, of fiber sticking up here, some hairs. Um, and a little bit around the edges here. Uh, no worries. Uh, there's a couple different ways to clean this up and make everything look really nice. So we're going to go over some of that. You can actually see this, this gray color here. Let's get this to focus. The gray color here, and it starts to run up into the material, is actually spalting um, from this sitting out um, a little bit longer than it should have. So we're going to spin you all around here into the shop. Now, let me just tell you, I know not everybody can afford one. This tool right here is one of the best investments in a workshop because I can take this and set my height, run this through, clean up any fuzz that's on the top, clean up any fuzz that's on the bottom, make myself a nice clean uh, surface. But since not everybody has one, uh, we'll do this the, the old way, uh, which is a sander and time. So, obviously nobody wants to sit here and watch me sand, so I'm just gonna go over this process real quick um, instead of taking a while to sand it and get it to a final finished state. So let me get a light over here. All right, so essentially we're gonna take our sander, we're gonna sand the bottom, we're going to sand the top, and then I think the most important thing we talked about earlier, getting rounded corners on here in the easel is not super easy, so we'll take our sander. And we can run some nice eighth inch rounded corners really fast with a sander. Um, so that's easy to do, only takes a second, we'll run all four corners. Now here is one of the best tricks that I have for cleaning up these bowls. And it's these little wire wheels here, let me try and get this to focus in. Uh, these little wire wheels, and you can see they're straight out of China, uh, but these little fibers here have a grit to them, um, and they work really good for getting inside a bowl. So, Basically, just run it along the inside. And this works easiest. Let me see if I can show you. Easiest if you kind of brace the drill, go high speed, and then drag the workpiece along it. See, we cleaned up, try and get the focus in there. 
Hang on. You can see here, uh, we've cleaned up all the fuzz that was stuck in here. Uh, and then you can use that same thing for in here, but honestly, if it's big enough to get sandpaper in, I like to use sandpaper. Uh, so it's up to you, you know, what method you choose to use. Um, as far as finishing these, there's a couple different options. Really, what's really popular nowadays and tends to be the easiest type of finish is something like Odie's oil, which is a, a hard wax oil, um, Rubio Monaco, um, just a normal uh, butcher board conditioner. Um, any of those options are going to be really nice for making this pop. And then, you know, the alternative is lacquer. Um, so I'm going to grab my two that I have sitting aside that have one has lacquer and one has um, a hard wax oil and let you see the difference. So here's the difference. So you can see on this one the shine that you get out of lacquer. Now this is one light to medium light coat uh, and then sanded with 400 just to knock down any nibs and then mm -hmm. um, and then I went back over with a fairly heavy coat um, to finish it off and then just let it sit and dry. Uh, it came out really well. I'm really happy with the finish on that one. This is a hard wax oil. So you can see it's a lot more of a matte finish. It is finished, and obviously this is cherry, so you know it comes out that nice red color. Um, it, it's very simple. It, it's a simple finish, but it does make a statement. Some people like this. I feel like this is more of a um, of a rustic type of finish, where lacquer is definitely more of your traditional. Uh, kind of makes me think of more of an old furniture type of of finish, but it gives you a really nice shine, and some people really like that. So I like to take both options take something for everybody um, yeah, you'll sell them with this one uh, once we get off here I'm going to finish rounding the corners I'll clean out the pockets here the rest of the way and then um, I think from there I may add if you see this checking that um, I didn't really notice was that deep um, when I first started this but I may fill that with some um, some CA glue and then sand that clean just so that I don't end up with a split right through the middle of one of these pockets. Um, you know, I don't want anybody to end up with a piece that isn't isn't good for them. Um, I did achieve what I wanted here with this streak from the Ambrosia. Um, you know, going through the pockets, I think that's a really cool look. A lot of people, you know, they've never seen it before, so it's really unique to them. So it's always fun to have something like that in there, that staining um, that people don't know about. Uh, so I'm going to clean this up, and then I will post a uh, a picture once it's all done. Now, I'll leave the live video going, and I'll try to keep myself in the frame here, and I'll clean it up if you want to watch. But I'm going to be running my sander with the vacuum, so it'll be a little loud. Uh, but feel free to watch as much as you want, and I'll close this out here with a picture at the end.
I actually do have a fun little uh, trick for whoever's still watching here. Um, so there's these other sanding balls. You get this from Harbor Freight, and it's just a, a red scotch Brite pad. And I found that this ball itself sucks. I hate it. Um, I would never buy one for myself again. But if you take a piece of the uh, net, the granite, granite net from Festool and just kind of let, rest it over it and then stick it down in your bowl. Then you can use that to get around in all of the little grooves. Throwing it out here. Uh, obviously it works a little bit faster than hand sanding. Um, on this, because we did such a light step over, there's really not a lot to sand here. So, you know, if you change that step over to closer to 10%, um, you're going to have a lot easier time when it comes to finishing because you're not going to have a ton to do. So, throw the sandpaper through her. things I look for when I'm finishing uh, and sanding these is little spots like this and I don't know if it'll zoom in so you can see it right there I like to make sure that I get all those cleaned up sometimes they're not even easy to see when you're doing some finishing and then once you put something like a lacquer on it it shows up like crazy so you want to make sure you get those those spots um, where you'll end up with a poor finish All right, so generally our tray is done. I'm going to touch up these corners a little bit more and glue this, and then I'm going to post a picture at the end here. So thanks for joining me. I hope you got something out of it. If you'd like to see more of these, let me know. Um, I'd be happy to do a live here every couple of weeks, and we'll go from there. Thanks.